Good morning. We start this morning's business with general questions. Question number one from Mark Ruskell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, to ask the Scottish Government for what reason the recent pay award to Scottish Prison Service operational staff has not been extended to non-operational staff in the same institutions. Cabinet Secretary Michael Matheson. The Scottish Prison Service is on a transformational journey, not only to bring change to the lives of those in custody and their families, but to deliver a modernised prison service. Every organisation depends on all of its staff to contribute to its success. Non-operational staff play a vital role in the delivery of key SPS services, whilst frontline operational staff provide the essential and immediate services required to maintain health, safety, security, and that play the key role in developing relationships with those in our custody, enabling them to transform their lives and therefore achieve our vision of helping to build a safer Scotland. The payments are being made in recognition of a specific set of circumstances unique to the frontline prison officer role. The reform underway within SPS will require greater flexibility from prison officers and a willingness to acquire new specialist skills and to undertake new training and qualifications. Mark Ruskell. Oh, can I thank the Minister for that response, but the issue has been described to me by SPS staff as a fundamental misunderstanding of the different roles within our prison service, which has left many staff feeling undervalued and undermined. The definition of non-operational does not just apply to office and administrational staff who themselves play a vital role in the prison service, but also extends to staff dealing with prisoners in frontline roles, for example, highly trained forensic psychologists who deal in uh, day in, day out with uh, some of the most dangerous prisoners in the country. Will the Minister agree that this pay award sets an unjust precedent by unfairly dividing staff in this way? What will he do personally to ensure that all our valuable SPS staff are included in operational and pay reviews in the future? Cabinet Secretary. Officer, um, I understand the concerns and issues which the member has raised. However, um, he will recognise that prison officers uh, are disproportionately affected by the move that the SPS are making towards a new operating model. And it's for that reason that the Scottish Prison Service sought to make this exceptional payment to their staff, recognising the unique circumstances which the prison officer staff will be affected by in these changes. Uh, whilst non-operational staff play that vital role, as I mentioned, which is uh, fully recognised, the modernisation programme which has been taken forward by the Scottish Prison Service does mean that it will significantly impact on operational staff, primarily prison officer staff, and it's for that reason that the SPS sought to make this additional payment. Ben McPherson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can the Cabinet Secretary give any more detail about the changing role of prison officers in Scottish prisons? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, President Officer, the Scottish Prison Service uh, published the Prison Officer Professionalisation Programme uh, last month. Uh, that sets out the programme of work which will be taken forward over the course of the next two years. It will result in significant change for uh, the way in which prison officers operate with a new operating model and we will see prison officers being recognised as justice professionals. Uh, that document was published for uh, prison officer staff and other SPS staff uh, last month and it sets out the progress of change that the service intends to take forward over the course of the next two years. Claire Baker. Um, thank you. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary will know that I have written to him uh, about this issue and this is not the first time a bonus payment has been made. In 2015 a similar payment was made and at the time it was said that would be a one-off offer. Um, can the Cabinet Secretary say if the bonus payment is likely to be repeated again and also if it is possible for Parliament to have some scrutiny of these type of arrangements? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Sign officer, um, my understanding from the Scottish Prison Service is that they have no plans to make any payment to prison officers uh, beyond the spring of 2018, which relates to this particular uh, payment in relation to the issue of uh, scrutiny of these matters. Of course, it's entirely uh, a matter for parliamentary committees to consider these issues, uh, but we have kept Parliament informed about the range of work that's been taken forward within the Scottish Prison Service and the way in which it's taken forward its transformational programme. And Dean Lockhart. Thank you. The previous one-off payment was awarded in exchange for prison officers agreeing not to strike for two years. Can the Cabinet Secretary confirm if any similar deals were agreed this time around? Cabinet Secretary. Absolutely, officer, I think the member has uh, misunderstood the way in which this exceptional payment has been taken forward by the Scottish Prison Service. It links to, specifically to uh, the way in which the transformational programme has been taken forward by the SPS 
and the very disproportionate impact that it will have on operational duties of prison officers. Question number two, Tavish Scott. I also to ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on discussions with the UK Government regarding the terrorism threat level. Cabinet Secretary. As the First Minister indicated during her statement to Parliament on the 24th of May 2017, she received briefing from the National Security Advisor on the reason behind uh, that decision uh, taken by the Joint Terrorism Analyst Centre to raise the threat level from international terrorism to critical. Similarly, the First Minister and I participated in meetings of COBRA, chaired by the Prime Minister and the Home Secretary, at which the threat level was discussed. On Saturday morning, the Joint Terrorism Analyst Centre, JTAC, reduced the threat level to severe, meaning an attack is highly likely. The threat level was reduced in the light of the assessment that whilst there was still an ongoing and dynamic investigation, there was no intelligence to continue to support an assessment that an attack was imminent. Whilst this was uh, downgraded on Saturday morning to severe, uh, this still means that an attack is highly likely. We need to continue to remain vigilant, but there is no intelligence that links this attack to any threat to Scotland. Tavis Scott. Thank you. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response? Following the Manchester atrocity, a uh, review into MI5's functions was announced in relation to tracking terrorists. Can I assu be assured that the Scottish Government and indeed Police Scotland are involved in that? And therefore, given the importance of the EU-wide Schengen information system in tackling and tracking criminal and terrorist suspects across international borders, used of course by police forces across the UK, has the UK Government clarified in any way what will happen to our ability to tackle terrorist incidents if we are no longer part of that system following the Brexit exit? Cabinet Secretary. I'm, officer, I'm conscious that a review of the way in which the security service have handled some of these issues is being taken forward. Uh, we continue to have good links with uh, Police Scotland and the security services in the way in which they operate in Scotland, and we will continue to feed into that process and to uh, support any review work which has been taken forward. Additionally, uh, importantly, if once the review has been completed, to look at what further measures need to be taken forward here in Scotland uh, and any learning that comes from uh, this particular uh, event. What I can also assure members of is that there's a full debrief being taken forward uh, with the Scottish Government, Police Scotland and other agencies and how we responded to uh, the change in the threat level to uh, critical. Uh, the member raises a very important issue around the Schengen Agreement, but also um, I should add the benefits that we have in working with agencies such as Europol in tackling serious and organised crime and in terrorism. And given that these types of incidents don't recognise any national borders, it's important that we have collaboration operating across the whole of Europe and uh, without, with, uh, with, uh, within the wider international sector as well. We as a government have made it very clear to the UK government we value that engagement we have at the present moment. We wish to preserve those links and to pre pre preserve the benefits that come from those links as well. But at this stage, it's unclear what the UK government's position will be in this matter when it comes to the Brexit negotiations, which is a matter of regret. Thank you, President Officer. Can I welcome both the questions and the answers of the Cabinet Secretary on this very important issue. As the Cabinet Secretary knows, people of all faiths and none it can be both the victims of terrorism and also have the challenge of overcoming terrorism. Given that in, in the last year we know that Islamophobic hate crimes have doubled in Scotland, that's in terms of the recorded incidences of Islamophobic hate crime. Will the Cabinet Secretary consider publication of the trends on Islamophobic hate crimes, which has been done in other parts of the UK, as a way of perhaps trying to help bring communities together to challenge both hate, religious hate, but also take terrorism on head on? Cabinet Secretary. So, and also the member raises a very important issue because uh, uh, security measures are only one part of the solution in tackling uh, these issues. Uh, we also have a responsibility to make sure that we are doing everything possible to tackle any form of violent extremism and those who would wish to peddle hate crimes in our community. We have got well established uh, links with uh, communities across the country that are taken forward by Police Scotland and other agencies to tackle matters relating to uh, hate crime, including uh, Islamophobia. Uh, what I can do is I can give the member an assurance that we will look at whether there are any further measures we can put in place in order to make sure we continue to tackle this, alongside that providing information in the public domain that can give people an understanding of the extent and scale of it. What I can say, uh, President Officer, in my engagement with Police Scotland and other agencies over the last couple of days, uh, it has been encouraging here that there has been no particular increase 
in the reporting of hate crime uh, in Scotland. However, what I have sought assurance from uh, Police Scotland and our other agencies to do is, is that they continue to monitor that in the uh, days and weeks ahead to ensure that if there are any indications of an increase in hate crime, that appropriate measures have been taken in order to address it quickly. Question number three, Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its position is and how the coalitions that have been recently formed across local authorities will impact on the provision of local services. Cabinet Secretary Angela Constance. <coughs> Sign off, sir. Local government elections use a form of proportional representation which gives more choice and power to voters and offers a choice of representatives in each ward. Proportional representation makes coalitions more likely since the number of representatives more closely reflect the distribution of votes cast. Kenneth Gibson. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that reply. Aberdeen Labour Group was suspended for going into coalition with the same Tory group it was in administration with for five years until a month ago. Meanwhile, no action has been taken against North Ayrshire Labour Group, who clung to power only with the support of four Tory councillors, or indeed Labour's candidate in Edinburgh South, Ian Murray, who called on Tories to back him to save his own skin, but urged Labour voters in the rest of Scotland to back the Tories. What is our opinion on the muddled inconsistency of Labour's leadership on this issue? If the Cabinet Secretary could reply in their uh, own Well, brief. presiding officer, if you, if you vote Labour, you might just get the Tories. Uh, and and what, what we have seen from uh, the Scottish Labour leadership is a complete humiliation by some of their councillors and some of their, their council groups. Because whether we've seen uh, formal or informal uh, working arrangements, these Labour Tory packs, there's a growing list of these informal or formal, including in my own area uh, in West Lothian. And what these formal or informal packs show is a complete lack of respect for voters, a lack of leadership from the Scottish Labour Party, and actually a lack of understanding of the risk, the risk of further Tory cuts and the risk of privatisation, or the cheering, cheering at further Tory cuts and at the risk uh, of privatisation. All because the Labour Party wished to cling to power and to sup uh, with the Tories. So uh, Labour councillors have betrayed voters the length and breadth of the country in Aberdeen, North Lanarkshire, North Ayrshire, Mid Lothian and, and West Lothian, all to do sly deals with the Tories. Question number four, Mary Evans. I remind the Chamber that I am the Parliamentary Liaison Officer to the Cabinet Secretary for Communities, Social Security and Equalities. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the action it is taking to tackle loneliness and social isolation. Minister Jean Freeman. Social isolation and loneliness is an emerging issue of considerable concern, which impacts on well-being and health in communities across age ranges, gender and geography. We have started work on our commitment to develop a national strategy, and in April we held a discussion with a wide range of stakeholders. In the summer we will launch a consultation with stakeholders on our draft strategy and with communities on what we should do next. I also recently had the privilege of meeting Brendan Cox to discuss the Joe Cox Commission on Loneliness and agreed that we will work closely together with the Commission and others as we take forward our approach and I will be taking part myself in the great get-together in June. Mary Evans. I thank the Minister for that response. Can the Minister assure me that the issue of loneliness and isolation for older people who are being cared for after their discharge from hospital will be considered by the Care Inspectorate and Health Care Improvement Scotland as part of their joint inspections of care services? Jean Freeman. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Yes, I can. The issue of loneliness and isolation for all older people is core to the principles of health and social care partnerships. All care services are required to deliver care that is consistent with the national care standards. And the new standards make clear that people should be supported to make and keep friendships and participate in interests and activities. The social and emotional needs of people are core to our health and care services and throughout 2017, Healthcare Improvement Scotland and the Care Inspectorate will focus their joint scrutiny activity on partnership strategic planning, leadership and outcome for people using these services, including paying attention to these matters. Question number five, Jenny Gilruth. Thank you, Presiding Officer, to ask the Scottish Government when it last met with Fife Council and what issues were discussed. 
Cabinet Secretary Angela Constance. Sign officer, ministers and officials regularly meet representatives of all Scottish local authorities, including Fife Council, to discuss a wide range of issues as part of our commitment to working in partnership with local government to improve outcomes for the people of Scotland. Jenny Gilruth. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that reply. Uh, can the Cabinet Secretary advise why, when Fife Council submitted an updated transport appraisal of the Leavenmouth area in early 2017, specifically with regard to the viability of the Leavenmouth rail link, Transport Scotland have yet to provide an update? This despite my being assured in this chamber on the 12th of January that transport officials will provide further comments once they have had the opportunity to consider the report in more detail. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Poseidon Austin, my answer to the member is no, I can't give her further detail uh, because that would be a, a question more appropriately addressed to uh, Transport Scotland or indeed uh, the Transport Minister. Uh, from my own constituency perspective, uh, I do uh, recollect how the reopening of the Bathgate to Airdrie line had a very positive impact uh, on our local economy uh, and many other aspects of social life in West Lothian. So I therefore understand uh, the importance of the issue that the member raises, but I do urge her to uh, direct her comments and her inquiries to Transport Scotland uh, or indeed the Transport Minister. Question number six, Richard Leonard. Uh, thanks, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its position is on the retirement age for prison officers and what discussions it has had with the UK Government regarding this. Cabinet Secretary Michael Matheson. Uh, prison officers in Scotland are members of the UK-wide civil service pension scheme, the terms of which are reserved the Scottish Government has always been clear that it disagrees with the UK Government's position that prison officers work to state pension age whilst carrying out frontline operational duties. The UK Government presented a proposal in December 2016 to reduce the retirement age from 68 to 65 for some prison officer grades in England and Wales. This proposal was not extended to Scottish prison officers. The Scottish Government officials have uh, since spoken to the UK Government. Uh, this is, uh, they have provided no update on the pension position since the UK Government offer to reduce the retirement age in England and Wales was withdrawn in early 2017 following a rejection by the Prison Officers Association. Richard Leonard. Uh, can I thank the uh, Cabinet Secretary for that answer? Less than two weeks ago, I visited uh, HMP Schott. Uh, and I met with members of the Prison Officers Association and, and witnessed at first hand the stress and high pressure that they work under. Will the Cabinet Secretary agree to keep pressing the UK Government before and after next Thursday to bring prison officers into line with the emergency services with a retirement age of 60? And can I join with those uh, today in calling on him to make the same one-off payments he has made this month to members of grades covered by the POA to other workers, uh, predominantly women workers, employed in the Scottish Prison Service. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, the member raises an important point in relation to the way in which the existing uh, pension arrangements apply for prison officers um, across the whole of the UK, including those within the Scottish Prison Service. I fully recognise the valuable role and important role that our prison officers uh, play within the prison system. I just returned from a visit this morning to Pullman Young Offenders Institution where I met with a number of officers there. We as a government have been very consistent in our opposition to the changes which were made by the UK government. We believe that prison officers, operational prison officers, should be treated in the same way uh, as we have for police officers, firefighters and our ambulance staff as well. I have made direct representation to the UK Government in this matter. My uh, predecessor made direct representation on this issue and we will continue to make representation on this issue to try and make sure the UK Government sees sense on this issue. We recognise and value, value the important role that our prison officers have and will continue to take forward measures to help to support them in the difficult and important task that they, they provide. Question number seven, Jeremy Balfour. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to reduce A&E waiting times. Cabinet Secretary Shona Robertson. The Scottish Government National Unscheduled Care Improvement Programme aims to deliver safe, person-centred and effective care to every patient every time without unnecessary delays anywhere in the system. Since the launch of the six essential actions two years ago, we've seen uh, a significant improvement. Scotland is leading the way in the UK in terms of performance against the four-hour a &E target and the number of patients spending longer than eight and 12 hours in emergency departments have reduced by over 81% and 97% respectively. Jeremy Balfour. I think many of my constituents simply would say that that is not good enough. In 2016, the Scottish Government's own weekly A&E target was only met seven times. 
Over 7,000 people waited more than eight hours to be seen. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree that this is unacceptable and will she take responsibility and do something about it? Cabinet Secretary. Well, um, Scotland continues to see the best performance across the UK and has been ahead of England for 25 consecutive months of poor performance. 25 consecutive months of core performance to March 2017. Scotland's core performance is over seven percentage points higher than England in March and over 16 points higher than Wales. Uh, I would say to Jeremy Balfour, perhaps he should look a little closer to home. Uh, Jeremy Hunt, of course, is a regular visitor, a regular visitor to Scotland. Jeremy Hunt was up just a few weeks ago seeing how our emergency departments have been improving through the work that we've been doing to take back to England to perhaps improve some of the emergency department performance down there. Perhaps he should look a little closer to home.